knowledge and information. This is the theme of this year's edition of Global Access. The importance of knowledge has been evident to man since the beginning of time. But the Information Society presents new questions. How does the increasingly intense flow of information affect our ability to maintain a holistic understanding of the world? And does it actually make us smarter or dumber? The human brain is seven times larger than it should be compared to any other animal of our size. Brain scientist Susanna Herculano Azel says it is still not unique in its structure compared to other mammalian brains. In this conversation with Thomas Geer, she explains how the invention of cooking came to play a central role in the development of the human brain. <clears throat> why, why are our brains so much larger considering our body size than, than other primates or other mammals? It turns out they're not. Our brain is about 2% of the mass of the body, which is what you find in most primates, in macaques. The proportions are very much the same. I think our brains um, look too large for the size of our body only if you compare us humans to great apes like gorillas and orangutans. Mm -hmm. and uh, why are their, bo uh, their brains not large enough? Right, exactly. So I, I think that is the much better mm -hmm. uh, question, although for decades the question that everybody fixates upon is why is the human brain so large for our body? So if the question now is why isn't their brain as large as you would expect it to be for their body, my answer would be there's not, there's not enough energy for them to afford both a very large body and a brain with a very large number of neurons, which is how uh, a larger primate brain would um, look like. Mm. We have approximately like 80 million, 90 million a billion, sorry, billion neurons, I think. We have 16 in billion in the cerebral cortex. Yes, and the, the front of the whole, mm. the, yeah, this, this top part. Yes. And that's, that's really important, I think, because um, that's not the part of your brain that you need to just do things with your body. The, the rest of your brain takes perfect care of that. Mm. But the cerebral cortex is the part that receives a copy of everything that goes on in the rest of the brain. So um, exactly because it's not required, it can do the extra job of just putting everything together, finding associations, finding patterns, making records of what happened, and then using all those records and past experiences to make plans for the future. Mm. So it's really the part of the brain that gives you flexible and complex cognition. Yeah, and you can conduct interviews and there scientists. And exactly, mm. and you can listen to me and think of what your next question will be and where you want the conversation to go. So it's, um, I, I like to think that it's thanks to uh, well-developed cerebral cortex meeting with lots of neurons, which are really the units that do the work, that um, we humans can live beyond our present. Mm. If if you have just or, the, the or beyond a biological destiny, or you... um, yes, but it's it's much more than that. You can uh, right now we react to the things that are happening. I'm responding to what you just asked me, so that's that's our current state. But I do that using all the knowledge that I've amassed over the years, and I also do that thinking of a, a plan of what I'd like to tell you and where I'd like this to go and what I think is important for the next few years. So it really makes our behavior about so much more than just being here right now and reacting to what is happening right now. Mm -hmm. and, and But it is essentially a primate brain. It, it's not so much different in its shape or structure than the other apes or even very small apes. Exactly. So that, that was one of the main things that uh, we've learned from looking at the human brain and figuring out what it's made of and comparing how many cells the human brain has in comparison to other, to other species. It turns out that uh, we can say that the human brain is just a, an enlarged, generic primate brain. 
I love to think that Darwin would have appreciated that very much, that we have a, the human brain is made in the image of other primate brains. And when you think about it, it doesn't come as much as a surprise as, as, as you would consider, considering that we do look like the apes. I mean, we, we feel more similarity if we look at small dwarf apes in the zoo, that they are more similar. Look at them. They are behaving just as, instead of dogs do not quite behave like we do, for example. Look, I, I am very happy to hear that you think that's not surprising at all. I don't think it's surprising at all. But I was raised a biologist. To most people to this day, it's, it's a, a very bad thing to call them an animal to call them a primate. Mm. There are many people who are deeply uncomfortable with that idea. Could we just go back in that? Because that's interesting, because we, you know, we have Desmond Morris, the naked ape, and you have Jared Diamonds, the third chimpanzee. And I mean, in a way, this has been a part of our, shall we say, Western uh, uh, scientific culture, that we are essentially apes in the in, 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 our, in, in our shaping or in our creation, if I could use that word. <laughs> in, in a way, yes. Mm. But at the same time, if you look at most of what even scientists themselves have been doing about humans, I mean, just look up the, 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 the literature on what appears in papers. So many of the recent the research papers on the human brain have something like human-specific genes or human-only characteristics. There's, there's a lot of effort that uh, has been going into the, the, the idea that the human brain must be extraordinary. The human brain must be different from everything else. And part of that is because we are well aware and we have been well aware for well over 100 years that ours is not the biggest brain there is. Mm. So for decades since people started studying this seriously, one huge question has been if we don't have the largest brain, how come we study other creatures instead of whales and elephants studying us because their brain is so much bigger? And, and how come that we, we are not two orangutans interviewing each other? So there must, I could say, well, there must be something specific with the human brain that is so still makes it, in a way, different in a sense that absolutely. we do create cultures, we do create literature, we do absolutely. create science. So it used to be thought that it was, like you said in the beginning, because proportionately our brain is much bigger than you would expect for the size of our body. I honestly think that that's irrelevant for a number of, of reasons, but yes, we do have one very important distinction. That cerebral cortex that gets a copy of everything and creates flexibility and complexity, even though it's not the biggest there is, we have the most neurons. Mm. Um, and just to give you a sense of proportion, we have 16 billion neurons on average in the cerebral cortex. The next species is gorillas and orangutans with about eight or nine, so half as many. And then you have chimpanzees with six to seven. The African elephant has not even six. The vast majority of mammals have fewer than one billion neurons mm -hmm. in the cerebral cortex. Now, if you think that these are the information processing units of the cortex, then it makes sense that whoever has the most neurons should also have the most cognitive capabilities, not abilities. Mm. And I think there's a very important distinction to mm. be made here. Like you were saying, we do all these fancy things. Um, if you think in terms of biological capabilities, like memory, just reasoning, uh, inferring what the other one is thinking, everybody that has a cortex has those capabilities. We're not alone. But because we have so many neurons, our capabilities are increased, yes. But that also gives us opportunity to transform everything that, uh, use everything that we learn to transform those 16 billion neurons, to shape them really, and um, learn and turn those capabilities into abilities. Mm. 
and, and that's where technology comes in so importantly. That's why we need education. That's why we need to spend ever more years in, in school and then in college and then getting an education after college because it's the only way we can really use the information that um, we get from others and shape that biological capability that we're born with into actual abilities. One, one comes to think of, is where is the turning point on in amount of neurons in the cortex, in the, neo, in the neocortex that would make, gives us these capabilities, but not, for example, chimpanzees or, or, or gorillas or orangutans? Some... Is it like 12 billion? Is it 13 billion? Oh, um, in, in, <laughs> in, 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 in numbers. In quantitative terms, yes. When does, when does quantity turn into quality? <laughs> That's, that's a really interesting question because the answer to me is more than just the twice the number of neurons in the cortex that we have compared to the mm. next in line, gorillas and orangutans. Um, the, I think the only answer to that particular question right now is we have no idea. Oh. But I don't think it's just the number of neurons because it's, um, let's put it this way, we know that about 200,000 years ago, our ancestors already looked somewhat like this, minus the modern clothing, and already had brains about the size of what we have today. And because the relationship between the size of our brain and how many neurons it has is still very much the same that applies to other primates, it's very reasonable to infer that 200,000 years ago, the first humans already had about 16 billion neurons. And yet they were nowhere close to being what we are today, to doing the things that we can do today. They, they certainly didn't have the level of complexity, the level of um, thinking, deep reasoning, or uh, just just think of all the many possible things that you can do with your life today and how you can manipulate the world. And it goes well beyond just having different objects to interact with. It, it, it has to do with the problems that you can solve, with the reasoning that you can, you can build and you can convince yourself to treat people in the same or in different ways. Um, so, and yet the number of neurons, as far as we can tell, mm. was already very much the same. So I think that uh, there's a lot of what we consider to be our human characteristics that are learned abilities and that have a lot to do with the technologies that we've developed and that we have accumulated and that we keep passing on that go well beyond the simple biology. Mm -hmm. So are we simply an animal with 16 billion neurons in the cortex? I would say no. We are the species, the species that has that many neurons, yes, but we have also been around for 200,000 years accumulating knowledge and um, putting all that together and overlapping enough across generations that we have a chance, we have an opportunity to pass along everything that we've learned. If a new species appeared out of the blue today with 16 billion neurons in the cortex, I very much doubt that they would instantly be like we are today. Mm. So that it comes, I guess, to education, socialization, in the sense of, uh, of learning things when you are, uh, and learning to use your brain and you use your capacity in order to or, to, or develop your capacity into ab abilities from the start of childhood, I guess. Exactly. So um, when I started this work, when I, when I first realized how uh, getting enough energy was so, with cooking was so transformative for uh, being able to accumulate the, num the, the, the number of neurons that we have, um, it changed the way I look at cooking in the kitchen. Mm. But um, now that I've, I've, I've had a chance to give much more thought to this distinction between biological capabilities and abilities, I have a completely new um, way of looking at professors and teachers, instructors. I am in absolute 
awe of them because who we are and what we do is absolutely dependent on these people who have, who take it upon themselves to not just transfer information to you, but to put that together, to make sense of it, and then give it, pass it forward, pay mm. it forward, um, as, it, as it were, in, in a way that the next generations don't have to start from scratch. We never start from scratch. We, we, we have learned lessons passed on to us from the people who came before us. And that's when you realize that um, all this biology is really for nothing if we don't have ways to preserve the know what, the knowledge itself, the mm. information, and the know how, which are the technologies in a stricter sense. So I've, I've gained up much deeper appreciation, I'd say, for both schooling and teaching universities are really my sacred places now but but also technology so that's where you have the mm -hmm. education in science and technology they are absolutely the foundation they're, they're the mandatory foundation for humanity as we think of it mm -hmm. today i think it's santaniana who says somewhere in his novels that every generation is every new generation is an invasion of barbarians and you have to educate them. <laughs> That's, I love that. <laughs> uh, which means, in a way, that 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 you are uh, children have to be uh, have to learn to use these capabilities or to develop these cap capabilities and turn them down to the, their exactly. abilities. But the the beautiful thing I think is that uh, it's it's not just barbarians. It's, 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 I, I, it's a negative I, I, I word, get it. I love it. But uh, it's a novel from the 30s, so we have to accept the terminology. <laughs> no, but it's it, what I mean is that it's it's more than that. And uh, I I like to think that every new brain is like a, a block of granite that has all sorts of possibilities within it. It isn't. It is not anything meaningful yet. But there's so much, so much promise within it. It can. Mm. It, it's all a matter of what it's exposed to, because de it's depending on that that it gets shaped. That it actually comes to hold meaning. It comes to actually be anything. Mm. Getting back to cooking, since you mentioned it, this brain of ours is is a is a very large energy consumer. I think it it it's a very small part of our body mass, but it consumes like. 20-25% exactly. of all our care. So it needs to be fed. Uh, and, and, and that's, I think, it, this is one of the reasons that you, you mentioned that, that the great apes have not been able to develop their brains because they haven't invented cooking in a sense of, of consuming food that is prepared. What, is the, what, was, the uh, what was the detrimental point? When, when did we learn this? And, and, and how did it help us to develop our brain? I like to think of cooking as a technology, and it was one of the very first technologies that our species came up with. Um, and it's like everything else; it's it's gradual, uh, and it accumulates, and it has its its know how that has to be passed on from generation to generation. And at some point, it, it accumulates new ways and new tools along the way. And at some point, it starts to increase really fast, of course. But uh, about three million years ago, our ancestors were already bipedal um, and had hands with uh, lots of very nimble hands mm -hmm. with lots of possibilities of manipulating objects. Um, which is already a combination of two things that no other primate has had. And that's really important because when you stand on two feet instead of walking on fours, moving around costs instantaneously half the energy. So you already have an advantage in that you use less energy to move around and you can also go farther so you can also find more food during your, your, your day. On top of that, with these nimble hands, between two and three million years ago, our ancestors not only were walking around, but they, can, they had already figured out that they could not just use pieces of stone as tools, but they could craft their own. They mm -hmm. could make their own stone tools. And one of the most important things 
you can do with the stone tool in the wild is you can cut up the meat that you want to eat. You can tear the skin of the animals that you've managed to hunt. You can actually hunt them down more efficiently. You can also chop and cut and grind um, uh, roots and vegetables. Yes, because when we speak about cooking, we usually think of doing things with fire. But I long know. before, But long before that, I guess, it's a question of preparing food and, and, and grinding. And, so you know. that's where you come to the question of what is cooking exactly. Mm. And if you think of it, I, I, to a biologist, mm. let's say, cooking is any kind of transformation that you can do to your food before you put it in your mouth. Mm. So this- It could be fermentation, it could be, yes. Exactly, yeah. which is, you could call cold cooking, mm. right? But cold cooking, like with stone tools or knives is, or grinders, um, is already something that you can do. And we know that our ancestors could do well before they dominated fire, mm -hmm. which is much later. Yeah. So you have stone tools well before two million years ago and habitual use of fire sometime between one million years and 500,000 years ago. But, but still in the end, in order to develop this technology, which is a technology, although we would call it primitive, no other animal species have developed anything close to that. Right. Uh, there are some, well, the you social animals have some farming like ants and so forth, but let's not compare us with them. Their brains are so much smaller. Yeah. In any case, in order to develop this technology, don't you need a large brain first? I mean, because you say in order to have a large brain, you have to master cooking. But in order to master cooking, you need to have a large brain. No, again, it's it's all a matter of quantity. Mm. The um, Our ancestors that uh, stood up and could use their hands to manipulate objects, they already had um, what they could afford as the primates that they, they were, which is something very similar to what chimpanzees have to this day. Now, what happened was that chimpanzees stayed where they were with this maximum of uh, number of neurons and body size. Gorillas already were uh, somewhere close to, to what they are today, but our ancestor two million years ago was something a little bit bigger than a chimpanzee today, but with a brain about the size of a chimpanzee brain. We know that that is a lot of neurons, and we know Know that chimpanzees can use tools, they have culture, um, they can have very complex societies, they can learn very complex things, including language. Mm. Now, but do they inherit it? Or do they pass it on? Certainly, that's the definition mm. of culture. Yeah. So you have, you find groups of chimpanzees that have different ways of doing things, different ways of solving problems, mm. depending on what group they belong to. So that's culture. Yes. They have technology up to a certain point. It's, it's very basic technology, but they have it. Now, think of all the technology that we managed to put together in 150 years just to, mm. to speak from the, the, the Industrial Revolution. Think of how much, how much technology our ancestors could really have developed already and, and amassed in that period of one and a half million years mm. between developing the first stone tools and coming up with habitual use of fire, mm. right? So in a sense, compared to what we we've seen more recently, that is very slow evolution, right? It's just that compared, when you compare to other species that uh, never showed anything like uh, this really rapid increase in brain size beginning about one and a half million years ago and what ours is today, it, 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 it's triple the size. Mm. And, and still, it's one and a half million years. You know, when thinks about other intelligent animals, the non-primate animals that obviously show intelligence, larger crow, crows, parrots, dogs, elephants, dolphins, um, would they be able to develop uh, larger brains or, or, or brains that are 
more rich on neurons and creating civilizations? Or is this the question of being bipedal and having able, ability to use your hands or manipulate things? I, I think we had a very unusual combination of features. Being bipedal, being a primate, which is really important because that means that compared to any other mammal, we have we have many many neurons in the cortex and it's still a very small cortex which means that the body around that doesn't have to be enormous mm -hmm. which is very important because the bigger your body is the more energy you need right so you you start realizing that it's many many features that come in together and we're lucky in the sense that we very much enjoy having all the neurons that we have and still not a very large body um, but the could other species have eventually develop as many neurons as we have Maybe it's a matter of being awake long enough during the day that they have enough hours to eat and get all the energy that it takes to support lots of neurons. Um, but I think there's also a really important issue that people forget. Every other mammal out there is doing just fine. Mm with sometimes tiny little brains, like you mentioned ants. Mm. Ants live, they live just a few days, but uh, if you live just a few days, not even one million neurons is probably plenty mm. to just put your body together and allow you to find traces and, and, and move around. Um, I'd love to think that if we were to ask mice, wouldn't you like to have more neurons in your cortex? Don't you need more neurons in your cortex? I, they would just go, what are you talking about? I'm doing fine over here, mm. right? So we have this idea that everybody should be like us. There must be this huge advantage. If it's a good thing to have lots of neurons, why doesn't everybody have lots of neurons? And I think it's because we have been operating under this idea of selection and moving forward and how there's one feature that is always advantageous to everyone. My view, especially from having compared so many brains, is really that biology is much more about whatever works. As long as you have a functional body, as long as you have enough neurons that get you by through life, that allow you to reach sexual maturity and mate and leave your progeny, that means that looking back, you worked. You worked well enough, right, in evolutionary terms. So I, I like to think that um, diversity is even more important that we've come to appreciate, not just for humans as a, a society as a, as a whole, because there we we have created and accumulated collectively so much knowledge and technology that no single individual nowadays can be the repository of mankind, right? We need different people. That's why populations need to have a certain minimal size so that you have enough people to hold the different you no know, pieces of know-how and no know, and know what. Um, and with that, so different animals too. Mm. So I hope that this division of labor between our brains have worked out fine. So thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs>